I consider myself almost like a maestro. It's an orchestration. Speaker Emerita Nancy Pelosi visits our studios to discuss the art of her power, her ability to keep Democrats together to pass big pieces of legislation. I could hear them saying, you should see what she did to me. You should see what she did to me. And how the attack on the Capitol impacted her staff. Nancy, Nancy. What do you see in their eyes? Trauma, just so traumatized. Plus, her role in President Biden's decision to end his campaign. If I stayed in the race, that would be the topic. You be interviewing me about why did Nancy Pelosi say. There are some critics who say that this was a, a coup. Well, I think that that's stupid. Plus, what it's like negotiating with Donald Trump. Trump calls you a killer. What word would you use to describe him? Grotesque. Broadcasting across California. You're watching The Issue Is. Welcome to a very special edition of The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson, and with us this week is perhaps the most successful and influential legislator of all time, <laughs> Nancy Pelosi. Welcome back to The Issue Is. My pleasure to be here, Alex. And her book is the number one bestseller <laughs> on The New York Times. It's called The Art of Power, mm -hmm. My Story as America's First Woman Speaker of the House. And I'm assuming you're a fan of Hamilton, right? I am, but I'm yeah. more of a Jefferson person. Okay, well, the, but I mean <laughs> Hamilton. Okay, so the but in the musical, Hamilton. of course, yeah, uh, they have that that great song, "The Room Where It where Happens." happens. <laughs> and this book takes you inside the room where it happens, and <laughs> yeah. some of the most important historic moments of the last 20 years, uh, as you served as Maybe speaker sure. and leader, and even beyond that as as well. Um, and I loved that it seemed like the premise was everybody else has said stuff about what happened to you and this is your chance to say what actually happened to you. So there's been a lot that's happened in the room in the last month and a half. If oh, yeah. you were writing that chapter of what's just happened in our country, how does that chapter go? Well, that's for another book, another time. <laughs> <laughs> right now, uh, how it goes is that we have to win the election and that was the urgency of some of the decisions that were made then, because we do believe that this is a very different kind of election. It's not as if we're running against George Bush or Mitt Romney or Bob Dole. We're running against someone who has, in our, my view, disrespected the office he held and dishonored the oath of office he took. And so your, your thinking was that at this point, Joe Biden couldn't win the election, and that's why there needed well, to be a no, change. Well, no. I, I might, Quite frankly, Alex, it was more with the campaign as it was going forth, we needed a different approach. And the campaigns are not are something that you, first you make a decision to win, mm -hmm. and then you make every decision in favor of winning. And sometimes that is reevaluating re the approach that you're taking. And I wanted the campaign to be more, uh, shall we say, on a path to victory. It didn't mean we had changed the candidate. That was the decision the president made. Right now, as you saw with the change in the, shall we say, the dynamic in the last few weeks, we're on a path, but it's hard. You have to, you have to, I say the three M's, you have to mobilize and own the ground yeah. so you get out every possible vote. You have to have a message that is bold and progressive, but not menacing. It's unifying for the country. Mobilization message, and the third M is money to get the job done, and largely from small donors. You have to have three no's, no wasted time, no underutilized resources, and no regrets the day after the election that mm. we could have done more. Is it fair to say you think that the Democrats have a better chance now at winning the House and winning those close congressional districts with Kamala Harris at the head of the ticket as compared to Biden? Uh, yes, there's been tremendous enthusiasm. And one of it was that so many young people were not enthusiastic about voting. Mm -hmm. They see two, shall we say, older people, both younger than me, but I am, but nonetheless, two older people. <laughs> They're like, what? And so, yes, there's much more enthusiasm among young people. And in California, as you've seen, the numbers are so different for uh, young people, LGBTQ, Asian American, um, uh, Hispanic and black voters who were more lethargic about these two guys, but now they're very excited about her. So once again, you were right. <laughs> well, I don't know. We'll see. We have to win. We yeah. have to win, and it's not easy. Yeah. And I keep saying to you, it is not easy. And so he made that decision, and 
by all reports, you haven't spoken with him since, right? No, that's not. That's only yeah. been about three weeks. So uh, that's not a long time. Have you spoken with the vice president since? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm upset. And what have those conversations been well, like? Well, we've had our big event in San Francisco. Where in yeah. four days, we raised over $13 million for her campaign. So it was pretty exciting. I introduced her at that event. You know, there are some critics who say that this was a, a coup. Uh, they say that, uh, that Kamala Harris didn't get any votes in the primary, even though she was on the ticket, she wasn't the head of the ticket, and that it's anti-democratic for this to happen. What do you say to those critics? Well, I think that that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really stupid. Why is that? Yeah, that's no, really stupid. We, uh, she decides not to run. She puts her name out there. Anybody else could have put their name out there, too. They didn't. The president endorsed her. That was a, a, a big boost, of course. But uh, the, the word coup, unless they don't know what that word means, uh, is, is really a dumb statement for them to make. She's, she's a daughter of San Francisco. Uh, well, in the Bay Area. She yeah. grew up in Oakland. Yeah. She, she and, succeeded in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when you started in, in Congress, uh, there were 12 Democratic women. That's all. Now I've, there yeah. are 94 Democratic yeah. women. Uh, the concept that there could be a female president yeah. from the Bay Area, yeah. what does that mean to you? It's exciting. Kamala, I know her for decades. Right. She's a person of great faith, which is reflected in her community service and the rest. She's a person of great, uh, that's personally, officially, she's strong. She knows her issue, she knows her strategy, she knows how to communicate it as we see most recently with the woman's right to choose, but other issues of course globally and domestically. And she's politically very astute, so personally strong, officially strong, politically astute, knows how to win difficult elections. Up next, the inside story of how Pelosi keeps Democrats in line to pass historic legislation. I always say to them, I'm sure you know your district better than I do, but I know the issue probably better than you do. We're talking with Nancy Pelosi, the author of The Art of Power, my yeah. story as America's first woman speaker of the House. And let's talk a little bit about, about your legislating, um, because yeah. you, you are a master legislator. <laughs> well, I love being a legislator. Yeah. People always say to me, why didn't you run for some other office? I said, but I like the job that I like the job that I have. How do you define a master legislator? What does that mean to you? <laughs> well, it means success. It means getting <laughs> the job done. I don't think the public really has any idea the hard work that legislators do at mm -hmm. any level. I'm just talking now about the Congress. When we have a bill, for example, the Affordable Care Act, there's so much gathering the intellectual resources, listening to the public, the outside mobilization, the inside maneuvering. Mm -hmm. But people, I don't think they really think that we think we go there and vote and go home or something. No, it's a heavy lift. But it's, um, I, I consider myself almost like a maestro. It's an orchestration. You have a lot of talent, many uh, different versions of the story that you have to, uh, so I, I say I'm a maestro, but I really think of myself as a weaver, just weaving together the beautiful diversity of our caucus, making sure everybody knows that every thread is essential to our, our tapestry, and that even though we may not have unanimity, all the time we have consensus to get the job done and you may not have your way one day but tomorrow is another day and you have your legislation then i, I think i've interviewed almost every member of the democratic caucus in california oh, and right? talked to many of them privately about you <laughs> and the thing that they all say about you is that your knowledge of them and their district <laughs> maybe more than their own knowledge of themselves <laughs> and their district can you talk about the way you, you research and your knowledge of everybody and their individual pain point and their individual well, needs. Well, it, it was not uh, so much research as experience. Yeah. I, um, I was chair, northern chair of the California Democratic Party for a while, then I was chair of the California Democratic Party, and I, um, I know these congressional districts. I know the grassroots down to the last blade of grass. I know how different they are one from the other, and different within the mm -hmm. districts. You know, if you're more coastal versus more inland. So, and I've helped elect many of them over the years, so I know the challenges that they face. They bring so much. 
our state is the intellectual political resource for the country. Mm. So we have a big responsibility. And um, I always say to them, I'm sure you know your district better than I do, but I know the issue probably better than you do. So let's <laughs> see where we can find our uh, connection here. Let's talk about the Affordable Care Act. You tell this story of a woman named Elena Hung, whose yeah. daughter, Zia Mora, uh, yeah, uh, when your speaker portrait was unveiled in 2022, she basically said that her daughter is alive today because of you. We have the ACA because of Speaker Pelosi. Describe the emotion, though, when you hear that. Well, it makes it all worth it. I mean, it's really worth it. My why has always been the one in three children in America who lives in poverty, mm. goes to sleep hungry. And I, so it's always about the children. What, what are the um, three most important issues facing the Congress? I always say the same thing. Our children, our children, our children. Their health, their education, the economic security of their parents. The bill is passed. That bill's pretty popular now. It was a challenge politically back yeah, then. And, yeah. and you write about the process of getting it done, including, mm -hmm. which is interesting, your own Catholic faith. And one particular member who represents Notre Dame, yeah. <laughs> and you called in a favor. <laughs> What'd you do? Uh, so uh, I called uh, Father Hesburgh, who was just the hero of heroes. He marched with Martin Luther King. He, He's been just a champion of values in our country for a long time. So I called and said, I'm having some trouble with the bishops, but I want you to know that there's nothing in the bill. And I told him the people who were pro-life, who were supporting the bill because of the integrity of the bill. And I said, but I need to, uh, what can I do to help? I said, well, Joe Donnelly, we need your support there. So he said, give me his number. So he calls me. He says, Congressman Donnelly, the speaker and I need your vote on the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> so I didn't tell anybody because I had several tactics that, you know, I kept close. And then I, I was going into the cloakroom from the floor. Cloakroom is where members gather off the floor. And I could hear them saying, you should see what she did to me. You should see what she did to me. <laughs> some of them in humor, some of them borderline. <laughs> And then he said, you should see what she did. It was like the Pope calling me Father Hesper. <laughs> so as long as he said it, then I thought I can put it in the book. Yeah. Now he's the ambassador to the Holy See. To, to under the, the Vatican, uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. He, he went to the Senate after the House, and now uh, the ambassador to the Holy See. He and yeah. his wife, they're so lovely. And so, you, and, and so the bill eventually passes. And th but then later there's this fight to, to keep it, and John McCain, uh, yeah. ends up being a saving grace. Yeah. And we will always remember that image of him voting yeah. with the thumbs down. But thumbs you down had, heard around the world. You had a heads up to that. Yeah. What did he say to you? He said he would, as it was, it was, this was early in the evening, as it was, he intended to vote against it. So when we chatted on the phone, I said, you know, Senator, they're not doing any of that. They yeah. just went into the Rules Committee and said, forget all that, we're just proceeding. He said, you don't have to tell me what's going on. Mm. I know what's going on. And as it is now, I will be voting against him. And you think about without him. But I didn't, tell, I didn't yeah. tell anybody, yeah. any, anybody, not one soul. Uh, I don't know who else he may have told, but I didn't tell him one soul. It, it probably didn't tell Mitch McConnell because he seemed surprised. <laughs> <laughs> he did. You know how to count the votes, but he had counted that vote for, uh, for John McCain as an I, and but it was it, a no. When we come back, Pelosi on January 6th and former President Trump. So we're talking to Nancy Pelosi, the author of The Art of Power. And, yeah. and one of the things you write about here, you take us inside the room on what happened on January 6th, uh, which was yeah. just uh, uh, heart-wrenching to, to read um, and, and to think of all these folks that are coming, screaming, where's Nancy, where's yeah. Nancy? Nancy? Nancy, Your young staffers, and you describe the moment of seeing their faces yeah. Uh, because you were first taken to a secure location, yeah. you come back to the Capitol, you see their faces. What do you see in their eyes? Trauma, just so traumatized. I've never seen anything quite like it. They were just so frightened. They had for hours been under table in the dark with room closed, furniture 
up against the door where the other people were banging outside. They did get through one door, but they didn't get through the second door. Uh, vicious. So you said uh, when they were potentially coming to the Capitol, you made a comment about Donald Trump about what you wanted to do to him. I'm going to punch him out. I'm going to go to jail. And I'm going to be happy. Well, in uh, self-defense, he comes here, I'm going to beat him up. <laughs> I know I could take him on. I mean, <laughs> he's he, yeah, nothing. Yeah, you, you could take him. I mean, you also write about the, the difference between negotiating with George W. Bush, somebody you were publicly pretty critical of at the oh, time, yeah, yeah. and well, Donald Trump, uh, two different Republican presidents. You're, you, you're, uh, what's the main difference in, in, in negotiating with Bush versus Trump? Well, first of all, uh, let's say that Bob Joel, Mitt Romney, George W. Bush, now we're talking about somebody who actually was president. They're patriots. They care about our country. They honor their oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. This guy is saying maybe we should terminate the Constitution. Mm. This, is a, this is a horrible creature. People should, I, I respect people who may find reasons why they want to vote for them. That's their choice. But I see him, and Kamala says, I've... I've prosecuted people like him. I know people like him. I know, I know him. Mm. And he cannot be president again. You know, I, I, I spoke to somebody who worked very closely for Donald Trump and knows his thinking. And he said that of all the Democrats, he respected you the most. <laughs> he refers to you as a killer in a positive way <laughs> because he thinks that you're the most ruthless in terms of uh, operating in power. You I understand the strong. art of power. I don't like ruthless. Ruthless yeah. sounds... But he, he actually respects you more than any of the guys <laughs> because he thinks you're the strongest of all of them. Huh? If Trump calls you a killer, what word would you use to describe him? Grotesque. Okay. <laughs> uh, but but I mean, there's so many yeah. others. Yeah. People say, use a gentler word. Now they're using weird. Yeah. And that has a market because it doesn't sound, it sounds descriptive. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound insulting. It's descriptive. Yeah. Grotesque. <laughs> Up next, the figures that taught Pelosi about the art of power. As we wrap things up with Nancy Pelosi, the author of Art of Power, my story as America's first woman Speaker of the House, we do something on this show called The Name Game sometimes, where we say a name and then it's the first thing that comes to mind. But I wanted to do this with some of the people that I think you admire the most. Yeah. And, and when I say the name, if you can think of maybe a sentence or two that they taught you in terms of the way you think about okay. the art of power, okay? okay. Yeah. You ready for this? Um, no, but, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Why would I be ready? Let's start with, you... let's start with um, Congressman John Lewis, the most important oh, lesson from gosh. him. Oh, my gosh. John Lewis, uh, the spark of divinity that exists in all of us, to be respected and respected in ourselves so that we treat people with respect. Uh, Lindy Boggs, who was uh, yeah. there when you first started. Yeah, Lindy Boggs, she said, know your power and use it. Which is one of your mottos, right? Yes, it is. She um, taught me that. Senator Barbara Boxer, who was Congresswoman Barbara Boxer when you first got there. Barbara, oh, she was remarkable. Yeah. I mean, she, I love her, like, uh, uh, well, as a sister. And one important thing that I always remember is she said, never question people's motivation. Respect them. Senator Harry Reid, who you went through so many oh, legislative yeah. battles with. I, I love Harry. You know, Harry, oh gosh, he, we're not show horses, we're work horses. Yeah. And that meant a lot to me because then we could really work together without grandstanding or taking credit or anything like that. I know how important your Catholic faith is. Pope Francis. Oh, Pope Francis, saintly, just beautifully, beautiful. And when I've seen him on occasion, he'll say, pray for me. And yeah. like, no, you pray for me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Dalai Lama. Where the Dalai Lama. Him? He had like a couple of hundred people uh, at Lamas for lunch. And I talked to them about how we were going to uh, take care of the Tibetans outside of Tibet, uh, worry about those inside, do this or that. And we were going to, and I would say to the world that if we do not speak out for human rights in China, we lose all moral authority mm. to speak about human rights any place in the world. The Dalai Lama gets up after I speak and said, now let us pray for Nancy that we rid her of her negative attitude. 
<laughs> and, and wrapping up with three that I think you'll really like, Paul Pelosi. No, this is such a beautiful gentleman, really yeah. so lovely. Your mother, no, my who I know mother. is the, the key yeah. to so much of yeah. Baltimore's power. <laughs> Oh, well, my mother wanted me, uh, me to be a nun, so what can I say? <laughs> but uh, uh, she was wonderful. She seven children. She taught me from a political standpoint, not, not per, I'm not going to personal, but a political standpoint, the grassroots volunteers are to be respected, and she spent a lot of time entertaining them and, and bringing them together and listening to them and their ideas and the rest. Yeah. And, and finally, your father, who was the mayor of Baltimore uh, and a congressman, what did you learn from him? Well, one thing I repeat about him is he said, when these people are so negative, he said, he who throweth mud loseth ground. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, what is the most important thing you want people to know about the art of power? It's about respect. You know, people say, what is the secret? No, it's respect. Respect for the people uh, that you're serving and listening to them and, and what they really want. Respect for the people that you're working with who will vote to do this so that you're putting consensus together. And respect for people who don't even agree with you because they represent their constituents. So I think respect is the most vital uh, attribute to bring to any of it. Just always, and, and I always say, keep friendship in your voice and treat everyone as your friend, but know who your friends are. <laughs> <laughs> I have so much respect for you. Thank and, you. Uh, and thank you for like a, a class on being a master legislator <laughs> with the greatest teacher. Thank you. Nancy thank Pelosi, you so thank, you thank you very much. Thank you for watching this very special edition of The Issue Is. We'll see you next week. <laughs>